Hi, welcome to the University of Nottingham Asia Research Institute COVID-19 lecture series. Uh, my name is Gate Cheng Ku and I'm the director. And today I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague, Benjamin Robin Barton, who teaches Chinese or, or who researches Chinese foreign policy and global political economy among, uh, well, one of many things that you do your research on. Uh, and today we're going to focus on China's soft power in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. So Ben, what has been China's response during the COVID-19 crisis in terms of its image projection, its soft power? Uh, morning, Gig. So um, China's uh, soft power uh, projection, I think covers three aspects. Um, the first one is basically how to manage China's image in terms of the uh, being the criticism it has received in terms of uh, the, the being the epicenter of the of the crisis, so I think that a large part of Chinese diplomacy now is is basically about trying to shift the discussion away from pointing the blame solely at China uh, for various reasons. Uh, the main reason is also to protect the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party in China, um, but also uh, overseas. The second dimension has been uh, basically to, as part of supporting the first, really, as part of this move from shifting away the discussions, you know, of, of, of this being a China virus, as, as President Trump stated, has been to show that China, in fact, is uh, there to support and act as a kind of uh, um, source of inspiration for the rest of the international community. So it's done this through this um, form of mask diplomacy or virus diplomacy, where it's provided medical support, the dispatch of medical experts, financial donations to international organizations, uh, you know, donating equipment to countries who are badly in need of it, uh, and you know, um, basically providing a, a model for countries to, to draw inspiration from in terms of fighting the, the pandemic. So that's been the, I guess, the, the major, the bulk of China's soft power projection has revolves around these two aspects. But there's a third one, which I think is really starting to take a, uh, to consume a lot of energy in China, and that's the counterattack uh, against countries who uh, are now really trying to ramp up pressure on China. So we see that uh, Chinese diplomats and ambassadors uh, are using Twitter, for example, uh, uh, hitting the Twitter sphere to really you know try and uh, not only just to say that china's you know th this is not a chinese virus but also trying to attack uh, other countries as a as an as an extra form of protection essentially um so we see that uh, there's been uh, china's been obviously trying to you know uh, contribute to disinformation campaigns in europe in, in the united states so that uh, its its image is protected, but on the on on the other hand, it also seeks to blame you know uh, democracies, for example, for not handling the crisis properly, um, in a way you know lashing out essentially uh, as a way of, of protecting itself. So I mean, I guess some of these responses are, um, although slightly different, are actually perhaps an extension from the past uh, in terms of soft policy, or is it a departure from the past? I think it's a departure in the sense that in the past, if you look back to the SARS crisis, well, I mean, you know, we lived in a different world then. Uh, there wasn't so much social media activity. Um, China was also a country which was still very much emerging and uh, wasn't so bold uh, with its foreign policy choices. I think that this, the way that China's behaving now is simply a, um, a further representation of this mentality within the Chinese leadership of uh, uh, seeing this as a, a strategic opportunity to further enhance China's standing in the world. Um, and again, it's done primarily for domestic reasons to reinforce uh, the legitimacy and the authority of the Chinese Communist Party, but that is done symbiotically with the idea of projecting China as a, as a, as a world power. And I think that they've, they've really, the leadership was very quick to jump on this because um, even in China at first, the, the early reporting about the, the pandemic was all about trying to you know, build up the image of Xi Jinping as the great savior of the nation, having, you know, devised this great plan to fight back against the, the virus. And and if the statistics are to be believed, that seemed to have worked and, and added more credibility to the to the, the, the party's armor, so to speak. Uh, but I think that the leadership also saw this as an opportunity to, well, we're not only going to do this in China, we're also going to do this uh, in the rest of the world as well, and use this as an opportunity to, to reinforce you know, China's credibility and, and um, 
as as a source of power. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I guess it, it's also kind of uh, yeah, in between the SARS and and the COVID nineteen. Uh, you uh, you do this work a lot on on the one belt one road policy. I mean that's also a form of soft power, right? I mean. Yeah, um, I mean the, the soft belt, one belt, one road. Uh, the BRA is um, uh, it's soft power because it helps to project a certain image of China, um, the, a country which is you know which of course built its economic success on you know infrastructure led investments, mm-hmm. and then trying to roll that out to the rest of the world, uh, and um, you know that's of course that's also part of the. Uh, you know these these BRI projects existed before Xi Jinping was president, except that they were not, um, in a way, marketed in the same way as they are now. So, uh, and I think that the, the COVID nineteen will hurt the BRI, but it will not kill the BRI. So it's it's it will exist afterwards, and in fact there'll be a much greater demand for that kind of financing, which puts China in a stronger position um, wow. after the crisis. One would expect. Wow. Um, so how 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 have China's efforts been received by countries around the world? Um, what are the two most important revelations that China's engagement is telling us about how China is promoting its interests and you know how these actions have been received? I guess uh, uh, that has to be interpreted at different levels. So the official, let's say, the political, the levels of leaders of, of states, uh, on the whole, I mean. I think that the greatest critics have come from the United States, obviously Western Europe, um, uh, but there are, you know, other countries who perhaps uh, would like to criticize China but hold back from doing so um, because they fear the, the the reprisal, and that's more, you know, maybe less, not, not so much industrialized countries, uh, middle income uh, economies, and uh, developing economies. Uh, at that level. Um, even though there have been problems and spats, for example, with regards to China's relations with the African continent. Uh, in Guangzhou, there was a number of African citizens who found themselves being kicked out of their hotels, uh, of their apartments, because there was um, uh, there were imported cases into China and they were, they were deemed to be responsible. And these were kind of racist acts in China. Um, and that basically flared up in the context of China's relations with countries like Nigeria, Kenya, but it was quickly solved uh, diplomatically because I think both sides recognize that they need each other. Um, and so they, they, they were able to to um, to mitigate the, the damage. I think even though that that's the first time that we see this kind of negative vibes between these two parties. However, at the level of the citizen, um, you know, around the world, um, not just in specific regions, I think the trust in China has plummeted. Uh, I mean, I don't think it was ever very high. But I think now um, the trust that people have in China after all this is is very low. The only, I guess, um, uh, silver lining for China is that the trust in the United States is probably as low as it is in China. So in a way that helps to kind of deflect uh, all the, the, the negative light on China, uh, you know, because President Trump is so good at, um, at you know, um, basically uh, accruing uh, negative uh, vibes as well. So I think that there are two, and I, I also believe that you know that lots of people are going to lose their jobs because of this pandemic. Lots of business opportunities have been lost. Lots of wealth is going to be lost as a result. Uh, and I think that you know there's always people are going to see, seek someone to blame. Now they might do that locally. They might blame their local the, the responses of their local governments. But I think that China will also uh, be you know seen as as the as being you know, responsible for this, um, no matter what the Chinese government and its propaganda machinery says. And uh, and on top of that, you, obviously, in the United States now, you have a lot of um, leaks coming out about this Institute of Virology in Wuhan, uh, which is responsible for, you know, for having either genetically made this virus or, which is also the American propaganda machine, yeah. essentially. But yeah. um, I think that that will resonate with, with people who are angry. Um, and there will be there's def- there's going to be anger once hopefully the the pandemic subsides and there are question marks as to how this where this originated I think China will have a hard time trying to circumvent that. So e- even though these might be fake news that you're talking about the power of this fake. Yeah, news. I, I think uh, there are fake news on both sides, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's the Chinese side or the American side or. Um, you know, no one knows for sure. Uh, well, I mean, I'm guessing some people know for sure, but the rest, most of us don't know for sure. 
uh, I think what the Americans are propagating probably, are, you know, they're, they're giving conflicting information. So some of it might be true, some of it might not be true. Um, but I think that in the, you know, the, the in this kind of global uh, tussle that we have between both sides, it's all about, you know, who who can essentially uh, put forward the most convincing message, even though it might not be based on facts. And um, I think that um, uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, said this uh, again a couple of days ago that, you know, this it's the virus came from this from this lab, and then he was told during the interview, "Is this true or not? Uh, this is not true." And then so he said he denied it, and then he then he said it was true again. So, it's um, it's 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 not it's a it's a messy situation. Um, but I think that ultimately, you know, when people will think back to the crisis, they'll think that the first cases were in China. So China has to have some form of, you know, uh, uh, responsibility in this regard. Um, so if we kind of move this to Malaysia, yeah. um, how has how has China's promotion of soft power with Malaysia over COVID-19 shifted? Well, I actually think there's not been that much of a shift in, in China's relations with Malaysia or Southeast Asian countries. I think it's business as usual in the sense that with Southeast Asia, uh, China always tends to do two things. One is act aggressively. Uh, for example, what it's doing in the South China Sea. There's a recent example of of, uh, of a ship uh, shadowing uh, a Malaysian um, uh, exploratory vessel uh, working for Petronas uh, in waters that Malaysia claims. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, you know, to to kind of again mitigate the sensation that China is is just a bully, it will act in a way to um, offset that by before the the pandemic, it was Belt and Road Initiative projects and investments. Uh, which Southeast Asian countries badly need to support their own economic growth. Uh, but with the with the pandemic, it's been, again, China um, trying to support as much as possible these countries in their own efforts. Uh, and with Malaysia, well, Malaysia was, I think, very generous at first uh, when the crisis broke out in China by, you know, um, all the donations of, of rubber gloves, for example, uh, and other equipment. That was, I think, uh, one of the first countries to do so. You know, at a time when China's relations with Malaysia are always a bit slightly ambiguous. I mean, there's never any outright dispute, but there's uh, kind of underlying tensions, it seems. And um, I think the Chinese didn't forget that act of generosity. Um, So in in response, they've sent a a medical team which left Tony recently. They've also provided uh, equipment and they promised Malaysia to be part of the rollout of this vaccine, which is in a second phase of testing and will be ready by December. So Malaysia will benefit from it uh, in the hope that it works. So I think that's also in the interest of the Malaysian leaders, so to speak. So that's why when we see what happened in the South China Sea, uh, the the response from the Minister, the Minister of Defence in Malaysia was again muted, saying, you know, we should talk about peace, we should seek so, uh, solutions to, 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 to maintain peace. And there was no criticism. And, and that's, I think, quite typical of um, of uh, how countries in the region have reacted to the pandemic and how China has treated countries in the region as well. Um, so in a sense, uh, it's, it's, I think it's really business as usual. Um, and, uh, but it is giving, I think in the longer term, um, it's giving out the, the idea that China is really being, is, is, is able to impose itself. Uh, and maybe I'll come back to that later in the final question. Uh, it's really able to impose its vision of how it wants um, countries to treat it and how it wants to be treated um, in Southeast Asia. And it seems that a lot of Southeast Asian countries and Malaysia included tend to toe the line, at least officially speaking, as to what China wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is likely to be the medium to long term impacts on China's soft power? Um, Where does this leave China's hegemonic aspirations? Well, uh, in terms of hegemonic aspirations, I mean, if we if we take a kind of classic definition of a, what a, hege- a hegemon would require, so it's uh, economic power, uh, military power as well. Uh, obviously, after this pandemic, um, my feeling is that China's role in the world economy is going to be strengthened because, you know, if you look at the other motors of the world economy, they're going to take quite some time to recover. The United States um, and the European Union and Japan, I mean, even though there's a lot of talk about, you know, kind of going back to some form of normality and opening up businesses again, I mean, let's face it, for as long as there continue to be thousands of cases reported a day, there's going to be no businesses as usual there. Um, 
Now, the Chinese claim to have, have you know, got a grip over the, the pandemic and they've started up manufacturing again. Um, and beyond that, China will be able to provide, um, you know, the financing that countries need, I think, to bounce back. So, of course, China is not going to provide a stimulus package for all countries around the world, but it's going to be able to promise investments uh, at a time when, when, you know, different countries and regions badly need them. Um, now, of course, China's economy is also dependent on demand from, you know, the United States, the European Union, Japan uh, for, for its goods. But I think its its economy is still robust enough to be able to ride the wave of that for the for a short period of time and still be in a position to provide um, finance. OK, uh, you're frozen. Hello? Yeah. Hi. OK. Uh, no, lean lean forward so that yeah. okay, so that you're not too tiny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, that's one element. The 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 component with regards to military strength, I think that will con the Chinese government will continue to provide the budget for that. Although China is still a long way off um, its American counterparts. Um, so I think that that puts uh, China in a in a relatively strong position. In the in the medium term, but I think where where China is going to face uh, obstacles to its hegemonic aspirations is that there's going to be obvious resistance. I mean, there was before the crisis broke out, but I think the what well, the what well, the pandemic has shown is that um, there are parts of the world where Ch China's reputation and and its image, both at the official level and uh, and the kind of grassroots the civil society level, is you know, no, I think that the, the greatest issue that, that China will face is that of trust. The people do not trust the leadership in China uh, and they do not trust their intentions, no matter how the how many times they attempt to sugarcoat it. And I think that's the great difference between China and the United States is that for all the United States flaws and uh, in its democracy, it's a country which is still open and can be read by others, uh, you know, outside of the country and, you know, has functioning democratic institutions and it based its hegemonic um, status around that. And China does not have that. And I think that that's going to be essentially uh, its greatest challenge if it does aspire to become you know, a world power, essentially. So it's its lack of transparency and its kind of um, concentration of power in this CCP? Correct, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that you know, we, we, we get a, a snapshot of how uh, things panned out in China during the crisis, um, maybe through some Western um, media outlets. But on the whole, we'll never really, as outsiders, get a, a full impression of what it was like to be uh, in China during the lockdown and in Wuhan in particular, or Hubei province. And, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of anger in China as well about that. So uh, it's not just, I think, the people outside of China who, who feel that that concern. I think in China, within China as well, but they're, of course, the, the authorities have their ways of, you know, maintaining um, stability and control. Okay, so the, um, moving on to the last point, I'm thinking about COVID-19 and the evolving global context. How do you think Southeast Asia will see China's image or soft power? Yeah, so... Uh, um, I guess rebounding on the, the point on Malaysia, I think Southeast Asian countries similar to Malaysia have basically received Chinese support and um, to help tackle the, their own respective uh, uh, national crises. So, of course, they've, they've been recipients of a lot of uh, support, um, you know, whether diplomatic support or, or physical medical support. Uh, but I think interesting cases have been the responses in Southeast Asia, which say a lot about Chinese influence. So, for example, if you take Singapore, OK, Singapore is not a democratic state by any stretch of the imagination. But the leadership in Singapore uh, refused to, at the outset of the crisis, refused to criticize China. So uh, there was a lot of think thinking in Singapore when they decided to stop uh, Chinese citizens from Wuhan and Hubei province being allowed into Singapore. There was a lot of concern about what image this would project to China by you know, pre preventing these citizens from coming in. So um, that I think is a, a lot of emphasis goes on, you know, we don't want to upset the Chinese. So that's why when Malaysia uh, finds itself um, having to deal with a, with a Chinese vessel in waters that claims to be its own in the South China Sea, the leadership says nothing because they see the advantages the, the practical advantages of cooperating with China, but they also fear 
uh, the the kind of uh, China's economic statecraft of you know if if a country is too vocal in its criticism um, to uh, towards the Chinese, and then there are states in Southeast Asia which of course are very pro Chinese and have, have been lavishing praise on China. So Cambodia, I guess, is the best example of that. And Hun Sen's own legitimacy, you know, kind of depends on support he gets from Beijing. Um, but so I think as a whole, China is quite content with the response, uh, you know, diplomatically speaking, from this part of the world. And that shows that China's soft power is, you know, uh, it works. I mean, even if it's uh, one which is um, perhaps punitive uh, in the sense that countries are afraid to step out of line, uh, nonetheless, that's a form of, of, you know, getting other countries to, to, to change their behavior without actually having to threaten them. And, um, and that's proof of, 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 a, of a form of, of soft power. So I think that this crisis has revealed the extent to which uh, that part of Chinese uh, diplomacy is, or how important that is to China, because obviously China expends a lot of political capital in, in getting ASEAN and Southeast Asian states to, to, to align themselves to, to China to a certain extent, or, or at least um, you know, hedge between China and the, and the United States. And I mean, um, actually, ASEAN became China's greatest trade partner uh, during the crisis. So that uh, also says a lot about the, the importance that China has and it's how it's anchored into the region as well. Um, so no doubt that that also explains why uh, leaders across the region uh, might think that, uh, uh, that China has not handled the crisis uh, responsibly, but they will never say it out loud. So, uh, so I think that, in, in effect, uh, Chinese South Pan Southeast Asia is, seems to be working. Can I ask just one last thing, and it has to do with how much how much uh, control the state or the, the Chinese government actually has. Uh, there have been stories of aid and med medical delivery from China, and then that some of these things end up being of poor quality. Yeah. So, um, is that you know, is it actually the government, the central government? Is it just of smaller? Do they have a control over that? I think that yeah, that's a uh, often a. Uh, uh, a perception that we have that it's the government which is all controlling but i think that uh indeed it's uh, i mean like we saw the outbreak of the crisis itself was poor management by the local authorities in hubei province right so so there's often a disjuncture between the central government and the provincial actors in the case of the of the materials themselves actually it's private companies often uh, or even uh, the alibaba foundation uh, claims to have given donations but actually they're not donations they're contracts uh, so that's, uh, it's, it's uh, and um, indeed, uh, there was a story of um, masks which were meant to be made in China, which were going to France, or was it Germany? And the minute they touched down onto the, the runway, uh, they set off again to the United States because the bidder from the US was higher from that of the European country. And that's because it was the Chinese company who just thought to make a profit from this. So, I mean, I think some of it is donation, some of it is um, of, with a monetary interest uh, attached to it. And indeed, it's a, it's a multiplicity of actors, but I guess the, the government has, um, you know, is, is basically providing uh, kind of the general guidelines for what it wants. And then it's uh, the implementation is up to either the provincial actors or the, the, the private companies themselves. So it's, um, it's not just a one way street, but, you know, on the whole, it's I think the, the government has a kind of overview of, of what what takes place. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>